Our God is an awesome God. And he is great. And he is greatly to be praised. We bless his name because he's good. We don't worry about whether or not today was good. We know God is good. So whether we're having a good day or a bad day, God is sure enough good. Amen. 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 Now this year, uh, I am so appreciative of this opportunity uh, to be standing before you. Um, it is my honor uh, to be standing for you before you and to be used um, by our great God. I appreciate Brother Mike. Um, he's an amazing man. Why don't you give him a hand? He's an amazing man. I feel humbled. I feel humbled because there are, there are so many others uh, he could have chosen to speak to you on tonight. Um, and I appreciate this opportunity. He told me this year uh, that I have a little latitude. Uh, amen. <laughs> and so I'm going to try my best and and do the best I can while I am here. Uh, I have approximately 30 minutes. Uh, it is now 7.26. So that means by uh, 8.26. Uh, <laughs> if you can, why don't you just, and if you don't mind, you can just help me preach a little bit. Um, look at somebody close to you, look them right in the eye, and tell them, I need you. <laughs> Did they believe you? Well, if they didn't believe you, look at someone else. <laughs> and tell them, I need you too. I have been... Uh, I've been asked to speak on cruciform community, a scandal of fellowship, and I'm hoping that uh, you won't feel scandalized from having sat here and endured me. Oh, I know why you're all here. I do. You thought N.T. Wright was tonight. <laughs> surprise, surprise, surprise. <laughs> We're going to be reading in the Bible from Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, through Philippians chapter 2, verse number 5. That will be Philippians 1, commencing with verse 27 and concluding with Philippians 2, verse 5. The Bible says, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear about your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition but to you of salvation and that from God. Help me preach just a little bit. Look at somebody square in the eye and tell them, don't be scared. <laughs> For you, it has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here is in me, therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. 
Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Amen. Uh, let me give you a quick overview. Um, and if it seems I'm talking very fast, it's because I am. <laughs> Anytime we begin to interpret scripture, um, the correct interpretation always depends on understanding the context from which a scripture is being read. Philippians 1, 27 through 2, 5 rests in a context of the apostle Paul writing unto the Philippians in order to thank them for their gift which they had sent to him by Epaphroditus while he was in prison. The immediate context of 2, 1 through 4 is the exhortation to unity uh, in 1, 27 through 30. We will be primarily in uh, verses 1 through 4 of chapter 2, but we need to look a little bit at 1, 27 through 30. In this section, Paul urges the Philippians to live as citizens worthy of the gospel by standing firm in one spirit against the opposition. Oh, God help us right now. Paul continues this theme into, the, into chapter two, where he continues to exhort the Philippians to humility. In this section, again, the Philippian believers are being exhorted to unity and mutual consideration. Jesus help us. It is interesting that in this present climate of political unrest and upcoming presidential election that we should be examining this particular passage. Our country is divided uh, with aggressive rhetoric um, in very nasty Republican and Democratic political primaries, and it's seeping in the church. Philippians 1, 27 through 30 gives an exhortation to the Philippian church to respond to their outward circumstances by demonstrating a publicly obvious unity Amen. in a stance that strives together for the faith of the gospel. The apostle tells them that they shouldn't fear, but understand that this stance is a declaration of destruction to those who oppose the gospel, but a declaration of deliverance for them. He tells them of this struggle and conflict or this charizomai or gift of grace uh, is a gift of belief. But this gift of grace is not only the gift to believe, but he also says suffering is also a gift. So Philippians 1, 29 through 30 says, for unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. Are we still together? Am I talking too fast? All right. Well, let me tell you what they do at home. When I pause and say that, it's just, just go on, preach, boy. <laughs> the, the apostle says, therefore, because of our shared self citizenship in this conflict, and because of my personal struggle for the gospel of which we are partakers together, he says this sets up the immediate reason for chapter two, verses one through five. They are urged to heed his twofold exhortation to unity and humility. In verses one and two uh, of chapter two, the apostle issues uh, his appeal to internal unity. This appeal is based upon four parallel clauses describing the shared experience of the Philippians. In verses 3 through 4, Paul issues his appeal to humility. This appeal is to regard uh, others more highly than themselves. Here, yeah. In verse 5, Paul illustrates the kind of humility to which he is exhorting the Philippians by urging them to appropriate the condescension of Christ. Who's com which the, in what's commonly referred to as the kenosis and sung fervently in the Carmen Christi hymn, chapter 2, verse 6 through 11. The apostle is urging the Philippian church to radical and uncompromising unity and humility and a selfless commitment to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So it made me ask a question, what's wrong with us? Why can't we have real community? Well, I want to tell you, I think what's wrong with us, uh, kind of, uh, is uh, us. <laughs> we are the problem. 
Yeah. I don't think we understand there's a war going on. See, Paul goes in this epistle or this letter from the practical to the personal to the pastoral and back to the personal, all to illustrate that you need to get it together because there's a war going on. And if you're beating up one another, why, why do we do the enemy's work for him? Our outward ineffectiveness is indicative of our internal divisiveness. People say, well, why can't we do more as a church? Because I, ah. Uh, so I was almost like to put it in the cuss guard. You see that? You see me catch myself? It was like, I pulled it back. You see that? It's because we refuse to get ourselves together. It seems on all sides of our multifaceted brotherhood, we are cannibalizing one another and sacrificing our children on the altar of our own hubris. The politics of power and position have so mutated the definition of gospel that we believe it's a matter of liturgical preferences or our prideful positioning or our individualistic idolatry of our own felt needs. The present political climate, which has stirred a further division in the country, also has ramifications for the Christian community. So this word has a definite relevance in our immediate contemporary context. There is an implied temptation to compromise the gospel um, for those who oppose them that Paul wants them to remember that their political affiliation isn't with their Philippian swag. See, the Philippians were proud of being Roman citizens. In the same way that we are proud of being American citizens, sometimes we need to understand that it's not the donkey and it's not the elephant but our political cry ought to be, behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Then we can be united. I guess the question become, will become, how committed to unity are we? What if unity means we have to lose everything we traditionally hold dear? Or conversely, what if unity means that all the new stuff that we think makes us so relevant needs to go by the wayside? Are we that committed to unity? And so he says, so don't fear the enemy, though, and I, I like that. Only in unity can radical community be, be as scandalous enough to demonstrate that which is a stumbling block, Paul says, to the Jews and foolishness to the Greeks. But for us, the power of God. I think we often don't know who the enemy is. It's hard to demonstrate our radical community manifest in a united front against the enemy when we can't decide on who the enemy actually is. What's wrong with us? I'm not your enemy. Yo, I'm not your enemy. Stop shooting at me. Get off Facebook. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. Oh. Let me get some more water. Right? Okay, back, back to the note. Oh, back to the note. All right, all right, all right. Perhaps, perhaps there's a Tower of Babel type judgment from Yahweh upon the church, in which because of our prideful attempts to build towers dedicated to our own hubris and vanity, the Lord of hosts has confounded our language so that we can no longer speak the same thing. Or perhaps it is a self-indulgent, self-inflicted, and self-delusional addiction to the safety of our own academic, ecclesiastical, and or sociocultural homeostasis that we just can't let go of what we're used to, even if it kills us. It's almost as if we become junkies, fiending and jonesing 
for whatever old stuff makes us feel good or whatever new stuff makes us feel right. It's almost as if I can hear the apostles screaming. It's not about the old stuff. It's not about the new stuff. It's about the gospel. And while we, and while we fight in our camps, the enemy laughs. The one thing I like about Paul here is he ends the chapter one with encouragement of just hanging in there. I want to look at the end of chapter one of Philippians where it says in verse 29, for to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here is in me. He says, don't worry about it. I took it. You can take it. I think our fear drives us to our evil. We're so scared. We're so scared. So we stop talking to one another. We start talking at one another. And we parade around our bravado as if it's actually courage. When it is just an overt manifestation of our fear, we are scared. I am. I'm scared of us becoming irrelevant. I am. Oh, I wasn't supposed to say that? It's just me? Whatever. I'm scared. And so the sermon for today. <laughs> Paul says we have the same struggle. Same message, same fight. The fight is about advancing the gospel. Since there's a fight going on, therefore he says, here's the solution. The solution is real community. The apostle says first, remember our reality. In chapter 2, verse number 1, therefore if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy. First, recognize, remember our reality. The connection of these two paragraphs demonstrates the necessity for internal unity, necessary for holding back the destructive forces that would hinder the progress of the gospel. Paul turns from winning the worldly conflict of the enemies outside to healing the wounds so that we might become a cruciform community on the inside. Remember our reality. Remember who you are. It's, 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 it's an argument from ontology. It's what you is. He says, this is what you are. This other stuff is fake stuff. What you are, fake stuff. All this gossiping and backbiting, and that's fake stuff. That's not who you are. God, Christ didn't make you that. See, there's some real mystical stuff going on in being a Christian. God transforms us when we come to him in Christ. He makes us into something we were not before. And he says, this is what you are. Here's your reality. He says, therefore, Philippians 2, 1, he demonstrates the necessity of a power of testimony. Remember me and remember what we did. He connects that reality with what he has demonstrated in his personal conflict and in their shared struggle. This is one of those passages that it's easy to get caught up in the what, that we forget the why. Every time I hear somebody preaching this, this passage, they concentrate on the unity. and They concentrate on all that stuff. That's not the why. That's not the why. The why is this fight for the advancing of the gospel of Christ. The entire book of Philippians, over and over, I do this for the gospel's sake. Get along for the gospel's sake. It's the gospel, the gospel, the gospel. There comes a time when we need to be people who stand up for the gospel. Say amen if you can. So the reality of our 
cruciformity is this. He gives four characteristics. First of all, he says we have consolation in Christ. And I know the text reads, if we have, but he's not being doubtful. He's setting up, this is what you are. He says, since, since you're this, since you're this, since we have uh, consolation in Christ, this comfort from being with Christ. He says, also, our reality is our comfort of love. This encouragement, this mutual brethren loving one another. Not necessarily Christ's love here. Here, it's our love. He's saying we are made to be people who love one another. He says that's what we're made for, to love one another. And I will guarantee you, when the church gets to the point, we'll realize that our reality is that we're loving people. We'll stop hating on people. I mean, we'll stop being so hateful. <laughs> our reality is we have the fellowship of the Spirit. This partnership fellowship shouldn't just be fun little gatherings around green bean casseroles and red soda water. <laughs> but in Ephesians 4, Paul says, we must endeavor or strive to keep the unity of the spirit. It is necessary within this mission-minded community because it is a spirit that helps us in our infirmities and weaknesses. It is a spirit that goes before God um, with groanings which cannot be uttered. And when you're on mission, you're going to go through so much problems and hurts and pains that you're going to need the Spirit of God to give you comfort in your fellowship. Yes, See, we need the Holy Ghost. Is, that, is it wrong to say Holy Ghost? Yes. <laughs> I know we all knew. It's the Holy Spirit, Brother Hager. It's the Holy Spirit. I, I understand that. <laughs> yeah. But I'm an old school. I come from this Holy Ghost. <laughs> and I just think we need more Holy Ghost in the church. More Holy Ghost, more Holy Ghost. Stop depending on people so much. And stop depending on the Spirit of God. Because the Holy Ghost will do something. Folk, can't, let me tell you, folk, folk can run out on you, but the Holy Ghost will never run out on you. Folk will talk about you behind your back, but the Holy Ghost will never run out on you. Am I right about it? The Holy Ghost will always be there for you, and that's the reason our fellowship needs to be based on the Spirit. But our reality is also we have affection and mercy. This word splachnia, meaning the intestines. And every time I read this and I study this word, it, almost, it always tells me that as Christians, we become more human than we've ever been. Because we feel for folks. We feel, for, we feel other folk pain. You know, we shouldn't be able to run into our lives for 35 minutes, 40 minutes, an hour, or if you come to Metro, two hours on Sundays. <laughs> <laughs> and then run out of each other's lives and not care about what's going on. We ought to be merciful and show pity. We often need to be reminded that we aren't who we were before the cross, that we are cruciform creations, purposefully created to complete the mission of the cross in the world. Once you recognize and remember your reality, he says, start to repair your relationships. Once you know who you are, then start being who you are with one another. So he says in verse number two of chapter two, he says, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord. The first thing he says here in the repairing of relationships is to fulfill his joy. It's almost as if Paul is saying, you know, I love this church. You know, all through the book of uh, Philippians, he says how much he loves the Philippian church and how, how every time he remembers them in prayer, he rejoices. He loved this church. But it's almost like the apostle is saying, my joy is kind of, you, you know, I'm, I'm kind of all right with you. You know, I love you, but y'all are a mess. <laughs> y'all don't understand that? Anybody got family like that? <laughs> you know, I love you, but y'all a mess. You know, j just send me a card at Christmas. <laughs> you ain't got to come by. Don't bring <laughs> and it's almost like Paul is saying, you know, y'all a mess. Anyway, um, he says our reality, therefore, needs to match our rhetoric. Now, again, I tell you, I'm from the old school. I'm, I'm old school COC. One church. <laughs> Baptism. <laughs> I'm that dude. <laughs> and we run around and 
we spot that one church stuff. And we ain't. It's just a lie. And see, I believe if Paul was looking at us, he said, you know, I really love y'all, but you know, I, I can't, you, I can't like be really all happy. <laughs> because your rhetoric does not match your reality. You, you know, y'all talk this stuff. But as soon as somebody does something you don't like, you write letters and... How, how's that one? How's that unity? As soon as somebody steps out of the box that you created, you pretend like they stepped out of God's box. And suddenly we, we ain't brethren no more. Let me tell you something. My, my brother's sitting right there. That's my brother and with his beautiful wife. My brother could be a knucklehead. <laughs> my brother could decide to go jump off the pier and swim out to the buoy, take all his clothes off, and sing hidey, hidey, ho. <laughs> Guess what? He's still my brother. So this command brings us to, a con to the kind of conduct we need to have. Paul's exhortation moves into Paul's expectations. He says, repair these relationships, first of all, through being like-minded. This is a continual like-mindedness. Or have a meeting of the minds. Process stuff through conflicts. You've got to kind of process stuff. We've got to stop running out on one another and just process through conflict. And the reason this is important to understand because he's gonna use the same language a little different, just slightly different. But here he says process through conflicts. Then he says repair, repair your relationship through having the same love, this agape, this love that, that looks to meet the needs of those around us. This love like Jesus had. This I would die for you love. But I do want to re remind you that these are the what's not the why's. We have to do this stuff because our mission is bigger than us. See, this mission of the gospel, we have to love one another. Because if we don't, the world is lost. We are God's plan A. God doesn't have plan B. And so we, we, we actually, we just don't have a right to be unloving. Repair those relationships. Repair relationships through being of one accord, of one soul, or, or soul to soul with one another. Yeah, yeah, it takes a whole lot more than 35 minutes on Sunday, doesn't it? Then finally, he says, repair relationships through being one mind, of one mind. First he said being like-minded. Then he says be of one mind. It's kind of an interesting double up of the same word here. But, but I think he's telling us to re resist all this complexity that we have. You know, let's, let's not only process through conflicts, but let's remember our purpose through our conflicts. That if we go in the room and say, we got to work this out, we're going to stay there until we work it out. I'm not going to get so mad at you, I just run out on you. My wife and I, we have a, we have a rule we've lived by. We've been married in August to be 30 years. Yes, she's a saint. <laughs> yes. 30 years. But one of our rules is we don't go to sleep mad. And I can remember times we stayed up at 3 and 4 in the morning. <laughs> but you'll be surprised how amenable you can become. <laughs> yeah, baby, you right. You right, baby. I was wrong, wrong, wrong. You... <laughs> but see, that's, how, that's what love does. Because we have a purpose. See, I'm not going anywhere. She's not going anywhere. So if we're going to be in this thing together, we need to have this thing right. And so finally, there needs to be a radical readjustment. Paul says repair these relationships, but then let, let me be even more clear. We need to radically readjust ourselves. If you look in verses 3 and 4, he says, let nothing be done through, so, can somebody say Nothing. He says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. And I, I like the King James here, because the King James verse says, do nothing through vain glory. Vain glory. 
And the reason I like that because it's a little bit closer uh, to the original. This, this eye of kinodoxa, empty glory. And Paul, he's such a wordsmith, because later on in verse 7, he's going to use a very similar term talking about Jesus when he says he empties himself in the kenosis. And he's saying what happens is when we glorify ourselves, our glory is emptied. It's not glory. It's vain glory. Puffing up ourselves, selfish ambition, looking after our own stuff. He says, instead of vain glory, he says, in loneliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. That's a tough one for me, church. For me to say, you know what? Not only are you my equal, but you're better than me. That's a tough one, church. I'm as vain and as carnal and as worldly as everybody else. I use the same scriptures that you use to prove I don't have to do that. <laughs> well, you know, yeah, Jesus said love others as you love yourself. <laughs> but the apostle here tells us, no, no, no. No, no, no. You got to go down. You got to go down. Make others up. Then he says, finally, and I'm skipping forward a little bit. He says in verse number four, let each of you look not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. He says, now we need to start honoring others. This radical disregard for our own self-interest. This disregard for meanness. It's pretty, pretty anti what we are as Americans. You know, look out for number one and do you and I don't need nobody but me. Even some of our Christian songs. Just Jesus and me. <laughs> <Y'all>, <laughs> you know, as if everybody else don't matter. As long as I got the Lord, I don't need nobody else. Well, Paul would say that's a lie. That's, this is a cute saying, but it's just not true. Can I conclude? Am I all right? Let me conclude. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Christian community, the radicalness of who we are, the scandalous nature of our community, it's all about Jesus. We don't have gender issues in the church. We have Jesus issues. We don't have worship issues in the church. We have Jesus issues. We don't have race issues in the church. We have Jesus issues. We don't have age issues in the church. We have Jesus issues. If we just learn to give it over to Jesus, Start allowing Jesus to fix our mess. Jesus will fix the church because there is no relational rifts in the body of Christ that grace can't cover up. Everyone from the don't clap your hands people to the beatbox bass mic people to the should we have a guitar people there is nothing, there is nothing that the grace of Jesus Christ can't fix. Amen. To the keep the women folk in the kitchen people, <laughs> to the I am woman, hear me roar people, <laughs> to the why do we need men anyway people, <laughs> it's Jesus. Can somebody shout Jesus? Jesus, Jesus has torn down every wall. He has knit back together both Jew and Gentile, bond and free, 
male and female, young and old, modern and postmodern, boomer and millennials, white and black, Tea Party and Black Lives Matter, Republican and Democrat, it's Jesus. Can somebody shout, Jesus? Yeah. I wish you knew him like I knew him. Jesus set the agenda for the church. Jesus walks among the candlesticks. Jesus is the head of the church. Jesus watches over the body. Jesus is the fullness of him that fills all in all. Jesus is the foundation of the church. It's Jesus. It's not me. It's not you. It's not them. It's not us. It's not Pepperdine. It's not, it's not, it's Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Back in the old church, we would say Jesus in the morning. Jesus in the noonday. Jesus when the sun goes down. Anybody need Jesus today? Anybody need Jesus today? Anybody need Jesus today? Anybody want a church that's filled up with Jesus? Oh, glory to God. If you want a church that's filled up with Jesus, why don't you stand on your feet, give God glory, and say, Jesus, come on back and fix this mess.